Hi, everyone, and welcome to Live with the 19th, a virtual event series where we bring you into conversations with women on the front lines of politics and public policy. I'm Emily Ramshaw. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the 19th, a new nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom at the intersection of women, politics, and policy that goes live later this summer. Uh, we are thrilled to invite you into today's programming, uh, and programming like this is made possible by our sponsors. Uh, I just want to tell you today uh, that we are putting on this programming with the help of Bumble, a connections app designed to help you make meaningful connections in love, life, and work. Download Bumble now to start making virtual connections in all aspects of your life. Uh, while donors and sponsors do underwrite both our coverage and our events, they play no role in determining the speakers or the line of questioning. All right, with that, I am thrilled to introduce today's conversation with the 19th Washington correspondent, Amanda Becker, and U.S. Ambassador to NATO, Kay Bailey Hutchison, a fellow Texan. Uh, Amanda, I'm going to turn it over to you for a little bit of housekeeping. Thank you, Emily. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. First, we would love it if you share the 19th with your friends. You can ask questions during this conversation by tweeting using the hashtag the 19th live or by leaving a comment on our Facebook page. And please be sure to get notified about future events and read all of our coverage by visiting 19thnews.org forward slash subscribe. And now I am thrilled to welcome Kay Bailey Hutchison, uh, ambassador to NATO for the United States. Welcome, ambassador. Thank you, Amanda. Good to be with so you. We're thrilled to have you. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to start kind of with what the topic on everyone's minds, which is coronavirus. Um, you've been in Europe during the crisis. I wanted if you know to know kind of what the situation is there, what's happening in Brussels, and how is this impacting NATO's work? Well, it has been uh, a hardship, just like everywhere. Uh, it's been an amazing experience. We have been very careful at NATO, but we have carried on our business, but mostly it's virtual. We have five ministers meetings every year, uh, three that are defense ministers from all of our NATO allies. We have, there are 30 in the alliance. And then twice we have foreign ministers, which would be our secretary of state. And those have been virtual and because we had two this spring and um, we had them online with all of the uh, electronics and the national uh, uh, technology that could bring in everyone from their capitals. So it's been hard, but we have continued our missions. Um, we've had, uh, we've got missions in Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo, and all throughout Europe. And we're trying to make sure our troops are safe. And we have 14 day quarantines when you go in or out of a mission. So it's all those accommodations that everyone is making. And, um, I think things are better in Europe now. The numbers have gone down, and but we're still watching it, and we're still trying to make sure that we don't do something that would cause uh, a buildup that comes back. And of course, as I'm watching the news in America, we're seeing that some of the states are are going back in the mm -hmm. other direction, and um, we're trying to do our part in Europe uh, also to make sure that we aren't um, going back in, in the other direction and trying to keep our people safe. I talked a little bit uh, uh, with your team about this ahead of our conversation, the idea of making sure that a public health crisis doesn't also end up a security crisis for NATO. And I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about that and uh, the steps that NATO is taking to make sure that you know, transition does not happen. You know, and, and that's a really good question because of course, uh, if we let down our guard, then it becomes a security crisis. And so we are uh, talking a lot about continuing our military training, continuing our uh, cautious uh, approach, but making sure that our missions are completely staffed and that we're doing everything we can to keep the deterrence, which is the NATO mission, to deter our adversaries and to make sure that they know we're not asleep over here. We are continuing to have a strong and robust defense. We are also planning for uh, some of the 
uh, potential uh, risks that we have, looking at uh, buildups of missiles in Russia. We're making sure that we are working on defenses against that. Uh, we're looking at uh, opportunities in Afghanistan for peace talks, and we're encouraging uh, the parties in Afghanistan to start their meetings, um, even though uh, Afghanistan ha has the coronavirus uh, issues that are perhaps a little worse than Europe and the United States uh, because they don't have the health care systems that we do. So we're working to stay uh, totally current and strong in our mission, which is to deter our, against our adversaries, but also to try to take care of our people. So it's a balance, just mm -hmm. like um, you would expect but we are very, very firm that NATO is in business, we're operating, we're meeting. Uh, we haven't let down any of our efforts at deterrence and defense. And you've been the ambassador to NATO since 2017 um, when you were appointed and confirmed by the Senate. And we'll get to your own Senate career representing Texas later in our conversation. But I was wondering if we could step even farther back right now for maybe some of our viewers who are not as familiar with uh, what NATO is, what it what it does, why it was formed, um, and that history, and just kind of talk about that for a second, and then we'll kind of transition to some current priorities and projects that NATO is working on. Yes, uh, NATO, of course, is an alliance of 30 nations. It started as an alliance of 12 uh, after World War II, when President Truman and uh, General Eisenhower and many of the European allies that had just been through the devastating war in Europe. And we decided that together we would be able to deter another war like the first two world wars. And the, the, the nexus of that is our transatlantic bond. It's bringing America in at the beginning so that you can mitigate some of the issues that Europe faced when they were warring with each other. So it was formed uh, back in 1949 and it was a, a coalition of the Canada as well as America, that would be the North Atlantic part of the treaty, and then the European countries that had been in the war, which has now expanded after the end of the Cold War, many of the Russian, the former Russian satellite countries became independent countries and republics. So we now have 30 European members along with Canada and the United States. And it's a great alliance. It has been very successful, the longest uh, standing military alliance in the history of the world. And it's because we have adapted and we have stayed vigilant that we are the security umbrella for all of our people. And the transatlantic bond is what makes us so strong because we do everything together on a consensus basis, we build our defenses and we are ready to face the challenges to the security of our people. And how does it expand? You mentioned it started out with a dozen countries. Now there are 30 member nations. I know there are several that are kind of building up towards membership right now. I believe Ukraine is one of them. How does NATO admit new member nations to the, to the alliance? It's a great question because we require that there be a democracy and the underpinnings of democracy, which would be a rule of law, a, a of course, a democracy in voting, but also human rights a, and a working military that is trained for um, helping in a security uh, umbrella. And mainly it is our values that hold us together. So the original 12 became 30 by um, the former Soviet uh, republics who wanted to be part of the West, who wanted freedom, wanted democracy, wanted uh, constitutions. They wanted to have economies that were free market. And 
we didn't just take them in. We started really with a concept of partnership for peace, which was to help them establish the reforms that they needed to have the underpinnings of a democracy, which would be a rule of law, an independent judiciary, a free press. And when they met the requirements, then it would be a vote of every other member to let a new member in. So it has to be unanimous and there has to be a sort of a checklist of the stable democracy that would allow it to be a contributing member, not just a member that we would protect, but one that would take the Article 5. And the Article 5 is that we pledge that if one of us is attacked, we're all attacked. Mm -hmm. And that means NATO will come to the aid of any of our countries that is attacked. Interestingly, it's only been invoked once, and that was for the United States after 9-11. Mm -hmm. So the reason that we are in Afghanistan today is because Article 5 was invoked by NATO that we would fight this enemy that attacked America. And of course, that's terrorism. Um, the 70th, 70th anniversary of NATO was last year. There was a summit in December um, and there were some fireworks. Uh, for those who weren't following it closely, um, heading into that summit, President Trump had said he thought NATO might be obsolete. Um, then he uh, changed his mind on that. Uh, Emmanuel Macron had said uh, NATO might be brain dead. Um, there was the video of Macron and Boris Johnson and Justin Trudeau um, talking about President Trump that made its rounds on the internet. Um, coming out of that summit, uh, what was kind of the takeaway from all of that? And has it you know, hindered NATO's work at all? Were you able to move past it pretty quickly? And how have you worked since then kind of strengthening those relationships with some of our key allies? Well, Amanda, I've worked with four presidents and as a member of the United States Senate, and every American president that I've worked with has said that Europe needs to do more for its own defense, that America has been shouldering a heavy burden and that Europeans needed to step up. And when President Trump first came into office, he was very forceful in that message and George Bush had been, Obama had been, Clinton had been as well, because if we're going to have a strong alliance, it does mean that everyone has to step up and do the defense spending so that we have the capabilities. So the president was pretty direct about that. And what happened in the ensuing two years was that our allies did step up. They did start spending more. And it, they increased spending uh, $130 billion since the president was so very direct about that. N several of our allies have not stepped up enough yet, but they say they are going in the right direction and they admit that they need to do more because it was established in 2014 by all of the heads of state that everyone should spend 2% of their gross national product on defense for our total security umbrella. And some members have made that, others haven't. And I think now we're all going in the right direction. And what we're doing is, is pressing for that to be even faster because the risks that we all face are great and it takes the capabilities to be able to deter. So yes, um, there have been our works at some of our summits, but we all are in this together and we do have the same goal. And I think now we are working together, going in the same direction, not to say that we don't still disagree sometimes on um, issues or priorities or how we're addressing something, but in the end, everything NATO does is by consensus. It's 100% unanimous and and it works and we negotiate and we uh, maybe we disagree, but we get through that for the common goal of that overall security umbrella. 
And coming out of that summit, also Secretary General Stoltenberg had a reflection process that he put together and then announced NATO 2030 as a project last month. And I was wondering if you could briefly describe kind of what NATO 2030 is looking out over the next 10 years and what that project aims to achieve. Yes, uh, NATO 2030 is looking out toward what we need to be in 2030. So 10 years out, uh, where are our risks? What are the threats? And what are we going to do to make sure that we are ready for any eventuality? And I think that what the Secretary General is working toward with this uh, group that is in the reflections uh, process is to say we, we need to be stronger politically, keep our strength militarily, and we need to be a global force, meaning that really NATO can be the convener of all the democracies that have our values, uh, because in 2030, uh, we could have a much bigger threat than we do today if we aren't very vigilant in facing the new technologies, the new kinds of uses of um, space, for instance, as a potential uh, arena that could be a defense capability. Mm -hmm. uh, look at COVID-19. What if that turned into a, a weapon? What mm -hmm. if someone did what has happened as an accident uh, as a focused effort? to uh, divide our alliance or to uh, harm our people. So we've got to be prepared for the new technologies, the new asymmetric warfare uh, that we could face in the next 10 years. And we have to do it together and stronger and, and reach out to partners beyond our own transatlantic um, organization that is North America and Europe but really start looking toward other like-minded, values-based um, countries that would be a part of needing that security umbrella. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, Russia and China. I'm gonna pull up a, a note I made here. Um, the Secretary General has talked about this as well, including in the press conference where he was uh, you know, announcing NATO 2030. Um, and there was an op-ed in Foreign Policy this week by Lauren Speranza, who is the director of the Transatlantic Defense Center at the, at the Center for European Policy Analysis. And she was saying that, you know, it, it could be the case that NATO, especially as it relates to Europe, has focused so much on the threats from Russia to their security that they have not been paying close enough attention to um, possible threats from China. Um, and China has you know, bought criti critical infrastructure and made a lot of investments on the European continent. And I was wondering if you could talk about that, kind of the rise of China and how that will affect NATO's work. Yes, it is uh, something that we're looking at very carefully. And I think um, the U.S. is as well. I think uh, when you saw the Belt and Road Initiative that China has put together, uh, China is now... Um, heavily invested in infrastructure that could affect navigation uh, through, the, through our oceans. Um, China has uh, control of two thirds of the largest container ports in the world, um, including, for instance, in uh, the Americas, the Panama Canal, mm -hmm. the biggest facilities on either end are Chinese owned. So we look at that we look at the buildup of the islands in the South China Sea, which China said they would not militarize, but they are militarizing. We look at the uh, situation in Hong Kong. We look at the gradual um, building up of defenses that is clearly happening with China. And we know that they have been strategic and very thoughtful and patient in all of the things that they're doing. But when you start putting it together, you think, well, because they haven't abided by the rules-based order in trade and economic interests, and now they're building up on the military side, we, we want to make sure that we're ready 
We hope for the best. We don't want to have an adversary in China, but with the lack of, of, of integrity in their economic issues and with the buildup that we're seeing in uh, predatory lending, for instance, where they will lend on infrastructure and if they can't be paid back, they will take the asset. Um, these are not uh, good signs for what China is doing. So we hope we can keep working with them to have a better outcome, but we must be prepared if that isn't what happens. Um, and I'm gonna do one reader question on NATO before we move on to your past work in the Senate. Um, Robert in Austin wanted to know, what steps is the US taking to re-strengthen NATO after a recent period of cooling relations and how does Brexit impact our relationships with NATO? Well, of course, first of all, Brexit uh, isn't affecting NATO at all because UK is one of our strongest members, uh, one of our strongest allies. They're strong militarily. They are effective and very defense oriented. So they will be a leader at NATO uh, regardless of, of their leaving the EU. Mm -hmm. Um, on the issue, though, of building up NATO, we are, uh, I think, the buildup in the defense spending that we're seeing in the alliance now, $130 billion just in the last three years, and it will be uh, even more in, by the end of this year. I think that is showing that NATO is not letting down, that we are staying strong, that we are building our defenses, and that we are looking out toward uh, China and Russia as well. They are building up their missile systems. We're seeing that. We're building up our defenses so that we will never have to fight oh, that war. But at the same time, we're looking beyond Russia and also toward the activities that China is producing. So I think that we are adapting, we are showing strength, and we're showing unity that is how we will face these obstacles in the next 10 years. Thank you. Uh, so looking back to your Senate years, you represented Texas for a decade in the U.S. Senate. While you were there, you co-authored a book with your female colleagues about representation in that chamber. Um, and there's a provision of the tax code that's actually named for you. And my understanding of it is that it allows uh, partners who work inside the home and don't, don't work outside at, at, to still get the tax savings of contributing to retirement accounts. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about your time in the Senate um, and why you think representation matters. And if there are any other uh, examples that you think other than the tax provision um, of what happens policy-wise when women are at the table? You know, it does make such a difference. And when I, I actually was two decades in the Senate. No, my math was off, sorry. <laughs> yeah, 20 years. But um, I think it makes such a difference having women in a legislative body because we bring our experiences to the table. And I think that... Um, I will even go back to my years in the state legislature when I sponsored a, a bill uh, to make rape victims uh, not have to overcome so many obstacles. And when I realized that it wasn't that uh, men were against the law, we passed it very clearly. and but we had to work hard to do it. And it was because they didn't really understand the experience or bring it to the table. But it was the women in the legislature at the time that, and there were only five of us out of 150, but we brought it together. We all supported it. And we brought our experiences to the table that would say, this is a, an important issue, which men didn't bring to the table, but they supported it when it was brought. I see the same thing in women's health care. Uh, when I first came to the Senate, um, we were trying to make sure that mammograms, annual mammograms were covered by insurance. And that was something women brought to the table uh, 
because we had had friends or experiences with breast cancer and uh, many uh, insurance policies didn't cover uh, mammograms. So we bring an experience to the table that really makes a difference. And I will say that when I went into the Senate in 1993, I was the ninth woman in the Senate. So we wrote a book called Nine and Counting, uh, even though we were from all different states, different parties, but we came together from our experiences that were so uh, diverse in backgrounds, but experiences were very similar. And we wrote a book about it and we gave the uh, proceeds to the Girl Scouts, but we came into uh, the Senate as real newcomers. And that was the first time they'd ever had nine women at the same time out of a hundred. Now there are 26 women and it happened so quickly um, because, well, I guess quickly, but 20 years, but it seems amazing that it took so long, but yet now 26, one fourth of the United States Senate is women. And so I think we bring something, something to the table that's important. And we have made a mark uh, in making things better. The homemaker IRA that has my name on it was because I had an experience. I was a single uh, working person and I started an IRA. And when I got married, I could only contribute like $1,000 or maybe $1,200 into an IRA because I was married when it, mm -hmm. it was 4000 or 5000 if you were working. And I said, wait a minute, why would a woman who has chosen to stay home and raise her family, why should she not have a retirement security with tax uh, breaks that a working person has? You may even need it the most. And it also applies to men who decide to stay home and raise the family, which is becoming more common now. So these are things that we bring to the table and the women came together on the homemaker IRA as well. And we passed that uh, by saying, this is not right for us. And so I'm really proud that now there are 25% of the Senate, and I think that uh, we have made a real mark. And a lot of people say, well, we're going for 50. That's right. But I think that women have done well in the Senate and they have served uh, and been reelected. And now they're being judged on their issues, views, and that's the way it should be. And I'm really excited about that. We are uh, right at our deadline, but I want to squeeze in uh, another viewer question, and I will actually fold two questions into one. Uh, Victoria in Lubbock wanted to know, what would you say to a young Kay Bailey today who was interested in having a similar career path to the one you have had? And then Kathy in Austin, Texas wanted to know, after the Trump administration, what is next for you? Well, I don't have a next right now. Uh, although I, I don't think I'll ever really retire, but I, I certainly don't have a political career, but uh, I do, uh, I may teach, I may go into the private sector. I don't know, but I've loved the job here. Never expected to be an ambassador. I never even thought about it, but uh, it was just offered and I thought about it. At first I said no, but then I thought, well, you know, if it's something I really want to do, that would that would be something that I could contribute. And NATO was definitely on my list of, of things that I would want to do. And it's been everything that I could have hoped. Um, and feeling like you're doing something important for this alliance, for our security, uh, has been a great honor and I've, I've loved it. But um, I think to a young, Kay Bailey, I would say first prepare for all of the experiences that you can have. Prepare in your um, education, go that extra mile, do everything that you can. I, I went to law school um, 
and again, I think that really helped me when I went into uh, this career. It wasn't where I had thought I would be, but it certainly helped me. So I, I think get your education first. And then secondly, I think it's really important to always work harder than anybody else. I think my uh, anything that I've been able to do is because I go the extra mile and I always work to the very uh, nth degree that is uh, more than necessary. We, and I love working, so it's not like it's a big chore. I really like to do that extra thing to make sure that it's as good as it can be. And I, I find sometimes our young people aren't as motivated to do those extra things. And I think going the extra mile, persevering when you fail, good heavens, I've had so many disappointments and setbacks. Um, I couldn't even get a job when I got out of law school because the law firms didn't hire women. But I found a different avenue, became a television news reporter, and it led me in a different direction uh, from where I ever thought I would go. So I think you have to persevere, never give up, work hard, and prepare yourself um, in education so that you've got something to offer and you have a core belief. Um, you want to you want to believe in something that you're going to fight for, and avoid politics just because it seems like it's fun or or interesting, don't do it because it's tough and hard and you'll have disappointments. You have to do it because there's something you really want to do and a cause that you believe in. And so that would be my advice to the next Texas K Bailey, which I hope we have. Well, perseverance, perseverance and not giving up is a great place to end. Um, I have so many more questions for you that we'll have to save for another date. Um, thank you, Ambassador, for sharing your experience at NATO and also your two decades in the Senate. Um, we're really happy that you joined us today. Well, thank you, Amanda. It's been fun. And maybe when I get out and have more time, we can do it again. We'd love to. Thank you. Thank you. And Emily will be back in a minute um, to close things out, but I would like to remind you to go to 19thnews.org forward slash subscribe to get our newsletter, which will tell you about our future events. We have some very exciting things happening later this summer, and you can also read all of our stories. And now back to you, Emily. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. And thank you to the ambassador for that terrific conversation. Uh, I also want to just let you all know to stay tuned at 19thnews.org. We have some really exciting developments coming this summer, uh, including the launch of our full platform uh, and a whole lot of more virtual programming. Uh, I also want to say a big thank you to Bumble uh, for making this series possible. Uh, I want to remind you all one last thing, and that is that the 19th is a member-supported newsroom. Uh, we would be beyond grateful for your support uh, in making our launch and everything that we do possible. You can join our team by donating $19 today at 19thnews.org slash join. Uh, and as Amanda said, you can sign up for emails about future events and to uh, learn more in our newsletter at 19thnews.org slash subscribe. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you back here very soon.